welcome. Thank you. Thank you for for being with us. You know, we have we have some questions we want to you know, to want to ask you. There were some people that also sent in some questions, and we've got a chat feature going. Um, so we'll try to just get you know as as much information from you <laughs> as we can. <laughs> Um, I just I so I, I I thank you in advance for you know for for joining us for this and we're we're really really thrilled that you're with us. So, you know, whenever you come back, we just you you change our students' lives and we okay. we love to we love to just revel in everything that you do. Um, you're a force of nature and we love you. Oh well, thank you so much, Jeff. It's always so good to see you and to see Ralia and to have any kind of ties to Albright. It's really important, but it's truly an honor and a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you, thank you. Um, and thanks for everybody who's coming to watch. That's really awesome. I mean, you could be, even though, you know, we're kind of stuck inside mostly, you could be doing anything else, but you're here. So thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> you just start by telling us where you are right now. So people know, you know, where, where you're at and, and what's, what are your, what are your, days like right now? Um, well, geographically, I'm in Los Angeles, California. Um, my days are almost as varied as it they were before the pandemic. You know, um, I actually had a reading uh, to do the earlier today, and then I had a meeting. Um, I am participating in a lot of readings. I'm auditioning via Zoom, which is still, it's quite <laughs> interesting. It's quite interesting. And then sometimes self-tapes, which, you know, if anyone, if any actor had an issue with learning about how to do a self-tape, now is the time to rehearse it. Now is the time to... Get your ring light and start start working. Oh, now, can the I... The ring ask... light thing, I just remembered, I don't have any lipstick on. But the oh, ring light thing... Neither do I. Um, <laughs> you need it. Yes. No, the ring light thing is a little crazy. I mean, you know, yeah, everybody can be getting their supplies right now and really learning how to master them. Can you just explain for the audience real quick what, what a ring light is? Oh, use it? a ring light is a light that you use. You can actually use it on your phone. You can attach it to your phone and it helps um, brighten you up for photography. Um, then they have some standing ring lights that are opposite of the standard photographer lights that they have with the umbrella and everything. I'm actually using one of my lights right now because it gets a little dark in here. And also an actor always needs to find their light. Perfect. Thank That's you, Lynn Morrow. Thank, thank you, Lynn Morrow. Find your light. Find your something. Um, yeah, it, not, not too long ago, my sister, who sends her love, by the way, Hi. She, um, she's preparing her son to come back to campus for his sophomore year at all day. So I know, like, where does the, where does the time go? She was a student, you were a student at the same time. It was like, it seems like days ago, but anyway, not too long ago, she, uh, she said, uh, Hey, FaceTime me, FaceTime me. Why don't you? And I said, sure. And I looked at her and she had this absolutely phenomenal glow around her. And she said, do you know what I'm doing? I said, no. She said, I am in my refrigerator. I have my phone set up against a carton of milk. And she said, I saw some actress saying about, I, my, my ring light died. I had an audition, I had to do something. And so you open the refrigerator, you put your phone in and you get this amazing light. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Necessity, right? The mother actors, of- Actors, actors, we can find the way to make it happen. So you, you, you should see this. I have this up on, I have my laptop propped up on a book. I mean, a box. <laughs> on top of two other boxes. And I'm still like, oh, I don't know if it's high enough. You know, you, know, it's you find enough. the way. You look fabulous. So, okay, so you're, so you're, um, you're auditioning via Zoom, you're submitting tapes, you are doing readings, you are connecting with your, your people, yes. your management and um, agents and whatnot. Um, do any of it, just real quick, because like, then that'll circle us back to the, to the first yes. question that we have. In those, uh, in those auditions that you're doing on Zoom, are they ever with other people, or is it always just you and a, you and a reader? Like, or, or are they ever trying to pair people up at the same time in a reader? Right? It's no, just, no, no, no. Um, I've had two live via Zoom auditions. The rest have been self tapes. Right. I'm reminding um, you. Of water. Right there. Yeah. Sure. Of course. Mm. Um, and in the self tapes and in the Zoom, there is someone else there reading. Yeah. for me but they don't the only person they see is me gotcha i also meant to say that i'm also taking this fantastic shakespeare salon 
with this fin incredible director, uh, Ron Daniels, who I had never worked for with before. And it's a group of actors and we look at scenes and it's not like we're performing them, but he just, we're engaging with them differently because you know, everybody's Shakespeare. Oh, I have to be like this. But it's like, what if you, what if this play was being done for the first time? What if you rip away all of that artifice? And I've been learning so much. It's been, that's my creative day. Thursdays are my real creative days. That's awesome. Yeah. So when did you know, when did you first know that you wanted to be an actress? I really knew, I'd been doing it since I was age five, but I think I really, really knew when I was a teenager, but I didn't, uh, I didn't tell anyone. Yeah. I mean, cause I had been doing plays. I, I had been going to this um, wonderful African-American theater company in Baltimore called um, the Arena Playhouse. And I, every summer they had like a apprenticeship program. It's like a mini little fame, I called it because man, they worked us. And so you <laughs> trained, trained, trained for like two months out of the summer. And then you came back on the weekends in the fall because we always did a show during Christmas time. And I was the very gobbled sweet, very bibble sweet in uh, the Pied Piper in my very first year. I was so tall and I was so skinny and I wore a lot of yellow. And <laughs> it was like, oh, wow. Okay. My father is also in the business. He he created a lot of his own shows for um, Maryland Public Television, which is why we moved down to Maryland. And he also did a lot of what we now call industrials. Yeah. So we were in the background for a lot of them. You know, I always knew, I was always, always very familiar with the set and, you know, kind of felt comfortable. But it wasn't, it, I, I hadn't thought about it. Like, oh, I want to be an actress. But when I was in high school, I was really like, Oh, I'd like to do that. But then I thought, you know what? Maybe I should just. You're, you're, um, you're, you're, you're about to, um, you, you're realizing that you want to become an actress, right? You're going, and then, and then this thing called college happens. How, yeah. how Albright, why Albright? Well, I'm the oldest and uh, the oldest is the guinea pig. <laughs> I always like to say that. But um, no, I applied to a lot of colleges and the college I was looking at was Drew University. Mm -hmm. And I got accepted, but um, the financial situation wasn't great. But the uh, guidance counselor, Gavin Maffet there, he said, hold on, hold on. And he called Albright. And I mean, like I got in in May, like, we, my parents and I drove up to Albright. It was like a Friday or Saturday. And then we had the tour, we talked. I was gonna be an undecided major. And then it was like, okay. And then I was at Albright in August. And you know, I, I, I look at my life and honestly, it's just like timing. Well, I mean- A year I, later you're in Edinburgh, isn't that right? A year later, I was in Edinburgh because because the first class I took was was with Lynn and uh, Dr. Lynn Morrow. It was the Who's Afraid of Edward Albee class where I was the only person of color and the only freshman in it. And I took it because my dad and I had looked at the catalog and he said, oh, Edward Albee, so he's a good playwright. You should take that class. I took the class. That's how I met Lynn. And the first class, she said, oh, hey, we're having auditions. We're doing an Albee festival. Three days later, I was like, oh, I finished my shift at the cafeteria. And I was like, oh, I should go audition for that. And I auditioned for that. And it happened to be the man who had three arms. I didn't know any of this. And, um, happened to be the man who had three arms, which Albie had shut down production, a production on Broadway like five years prior. And then everything just kind of like blew up. Yes. It was amazing. I, I had, I kept getting these phone calls from Lynn during that period about, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, wait till you meet Saida. Wait till, <laughs> wait till you meet her, wait till you see her on stage. I mean, and you were with Ed Fernandez in that, in that piece, another really formidable performer, like, you know, like, you know, 
meat eater. <laughs> yeah, know? everything, and, yes. And there you are, this, you know, this freshman, like, girl, in this dynamite role in this amazing play. Yes. Where the, where the playwright himself comes to this festival, then had a festival called um, All Be In Excess. Actually, All Be Him, he named it itself, right? And um, uh, it was, it, it, what, an ex what an extraordinary launching pad for like, you. Like, you know, uh, like, you know, I was just there. I was like, oh, okay. And then it's like, oh, wait a minute. Like we had his artwork that he had at his house in the museum. People came from around the world to, they were like, they're doing that play. Cause we also did Happy Days and of course the zoo story. And it was like, oh, all right, well I'm in a play. And and then he, because his name was Edward and Edward Fernandez. So I said, Ed, and they both turned around and oh. Edward Albee only allowed me to, he, I was the only one who was allowed to call him Ed. I love that. But <laughs> the night before opening, did you know this? The night before opening, cause I had a, that four page monologue. Right. Oh and the night before, because he was staying with Lynn, Ed, Edward Albee said, hey, you know, we should change the way she does that monologue. I didn't know this. She didn't have a cell phone. I didn't, there was no cell phone. So she said, listen, she called me and said, listen, meet me at the campus center at four o'clock. And I said, okay. And that's when she told me we were in a room. She said, so we've got to change the opening monologue. And I was like, oh, all right. And an hour and a half later, it was done. Eight o'clock, we were up. That was it. And it was just, um, oh, you know, like the way Lynn taught me and the way she, uh, we worked together, I didn't even realize how big of a deal that was until like a few years later, because it was like, oh, well, the playwright wants this changed, so let's go. Yeah. It was, it was it's fascinating and wonderful. It's extraordinary how she had this uncanny ability to sort of um, suss out talent and passion. And if she knew you were passionate, then she was like, I'm there. I'm there with you. I will work with you and we will, we will do great things together. And it was just, it just, I know what you mean. I know, sorry. I don't also know the story that he came over, Edward Albee came over for dinner at her house and he you know he didn't mean it but he was kind of like is there um anything i can do to help you prepare for dinner and she, <laughs> lynn says yes you can wash the lettuce <laughs> and he did <laughs> and he did you know she's because later on she'd be like i made all be wash the lettuce <laughs> well he made her go up to new york with ed twice in order to get permission to do the show even though she had already put it on the program <laughs> and she was like well we're doing it and I'm going to get his permission somehow. So she did. So as working our way through, you know, through, through your time at Albright then, so there's this decision to take the production to the Edin to the famed Edinburgh Festival the next summer. It's a very small cast. Where it was two, a cast of two. Three. And, oh, that's right. Three. Yeah, John Chuba. Right. And, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I know. Um, I and, you know, and then, um, so what was that like? Because it, um, because it was a big splash there. It, 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 I didn't even know about Edinburgh. I did, you know, I was doing some kind of uh, the March of Dimes dance-a-thon or something, or one of these things, and she came to the campus center and handed me, I can't remember what the money is in Scotland, but she handed it to me. I said, what's this? She goes, you're going to Scotland. I was like, all right. And next thing you know, we were on a plane. Um, my first plane ride ever. Uh, it was... It was wonderful because, you know, I mean, a theater festival, what, what are you talking about? And I mean, we performed in the gym of the YMCA, you know, and there were rooms that people, other random rooms that people were performing in. And when we weren't performing, we went and saw so much theater and it was wonderful. And I didn't even think about any kind of award because what are you talking about? I'm in Scotland. And we got there on a Saturday we rehearsed on a Sunday and on Monday, Monday afternoon, she got a call and she was like, okay, and hung up the phone. And, she, and we said, well, what was that about? And she goes, oh, we just want a Scott, Scott's first, Scotsman's first, what is it called? Yeah. And- Fringe first. Fringe first, that's it. 
And we were like, what? Because usually you had to be in production and performance for at least a week. But some of them came and saw it at our dress rehearsal and they were like, that's it. And it was overwhelming and wonderful and so fulfilling. And it felt like it was kind of magical. And, and yet we all worked so hard for it and we didn't rest in our laurels. And, you know, it's a challenging play. It's very existential. It's also long, but we were all so committed to it. Oh, there's a picture from it. We were all so committed to it because Lynn demanded that kind of commitment. She demanded that we make ourselves completely available. And she never said, okay, you know, we knew one time we had to be at the theater, but she never like monitored us. It was like, okay, if you're late, you're late. You learned that, all right, but guess what? You, you're late, but you better bring it on stage. And it, it's, it kind of still feels like a dream. It was really wonderful. I mean, she got Brad to come because he, she made him the stage manager and we just, we had a great time. People who were so passionate about it, experiences that changed their lives, right? Yeah. So, so then, so you said that you had started Albright, and I, I'm not quite sure what you were going to major in. And then this year happens, and this experience happens. Uh, can you take us through the, the process of okay? So the theater is, you know, is going to happen, and then through the National Theater Institute, like take us on that path. Like, how did you get from? I think I think I can do this to I'm doing this. Um, it was pretty much the play after. Uh, after the Manor of Three Arms, it was so. It was around January of my um, of '93, and we were rehearsing um, 110 in the Shade," yes. and it was so fun. And she pulled me aside and said, "Listen, we don't have a theater program. I've been wanting to start one. Do you want to be a part of it?" And I said, "Yeah." And she said, "Okay." So you'll be a theater major. And I said, yes. And then we also worked uh, co to combine a ISP, an independent study major. So it was theater, African-American, and you did that too. Theater, African-American studies and women's studies. And so I made the decision that, you know, I already liked Lynn. I already liked working with her. I was actually fascinated by her and I like theater. So sure, why not do it? Um, and then I called my parents <laughs> separately and they each said, oh, no, 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 get an education minor, get an education minor. And I was like, okay, and I hung up the phone and I never paid attention to it, I, I just, I didn't do it. I was like, yeah, okay, yeah. And um, so then continued having, uh, being in a lot of the plays, we did the Colored Museum, Oh, we did so many plays. I'm, I'm struggling to think of all of them now, but I was also taking theater courses and also individual courses with Lynn and with Adele Newsom and being active at the school. And um, then you had gone to, you had attended NTI. So that was always Lynn's, part of Lynn's plan that the fall semester of my senior year, that I would go to the National Theater Institute in New Haven, Connecticut, New London, excuse me, New London, Connecticut. I feel like that was um, the prep course for graduate school because it was, I mean, so I had the, I, I've had like fame in different areas of my life. I had the Arena Playhouse and then I had NTI, which was no joke, like from seven in the morning to nine at night, it was warm up, voice class, uh, theater, uh, acting, that it was movement, and then it was, you had to direct, and then you had to also learn some stage management, and then you had to go and rehearse that, and then it was, but it was seven truly wonderful. More, seven days a week, morning to night, right? Seven days a week, morning and night for like three months, and I loved it. And so then um, I came back to Albright, and uh, it was the, uh, it was like, what am I gonna do now? And so then there was the program, what is it called? Not Next not Irene Ryan's, Erdas. It was the Erdas, the U University and Regional Theater Association. So you could basically go and you can audition to get into a graduate school or to a um, conservatory, repertory company, or a another different kind of program. 
and I auditioned and I got like 15 schools interviews with them. And I, I basically came back to Albright with like two grocery bags full of like material. And I was like, Lynn, what do I do? And she said, what do you want to do? Let's look over them and see what you want. And so for like three weeks, like every other day, we'd meet up to talk about which schools that I liked, which ones I didn't. And I applied to those and I got into the University of Minnesota, primarily because A, they didn't teach one specific um, mm -hmm. method of acting, which Lynn did not either. And I found that to be, I was like, let me, let me figure it out and do what I need to do. Let me create it. And also they had uh, a lot of voice and movement training because I hadn't really had those. And then also topping of the cake, uh, the icing was um, the Guthrie Theater Association. They didn't guarantee that you would get a role at a Guthrie production, but you would be working with the Guthrie c company actors. And I thought that would be a good thing. And it was, it was. Did, was the lab established then? Did the lab space in the, in the that sort of warehouse district of, of Minneapolis, did you, did you guys? My, my first year is when they were completing it. They okay. were completing it then. A um, couple, I, I sang with, well, actually I sang with Minnesota Opera while you were there. Yes, yes. And, um, they, we, they housed us in that warehouse district in a magnificent, building where the Minnesota Opera also had their rehearsal space. I mean, like, in, uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, to have the luxury of having a rehearsal space where you can just wheel in the whole set. Um, and right next door was the Guthrie Labs. So that was my, you know, I, except when I had rehearsals in the evenings, mm -hmm. I would just run, you know, I would run next door and see what was ever playing at the lab. Yeah. And um, Theater de Jules and all those, oh my gosh, so, so much incredible, incredible theater there. and. Yeah, how, you know, and it, it, and then, you know, for me, I mean, we had a number of wonderful experiences in those January terms, uh, you know, 110 color, yes. women, but, uh, but then, you know, then, then to, to see you, because I remember I come, I remember visiting you at the, at the University of Minnesota and you showing me around and it was, a, it was it, it's so, 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 so exciting. It's such a small world. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. It was great to see you there though, because it was like, oh, I know this person. Well, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate that. I want to talk about that for a second because you know one, one of the one of the questions a lot of a lot of people ask actors is you know the articulating what's their school, what's your what's your method, and and I know that in you know in working with the students at Albright, having a like you originally been um, been taught through Lynn. There's no just one way. It depends on the role. It depends on the. You know, it depends on the, the 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 play. It depends on the situation. Blah blah. You've got to be conversant in, in any number of uh, of approaches, depending on what the piece. You know, so was you know. So it sounds like certainly like it was a natural fit there at Minnesota. But subsequently, people are, you know people are asking like you know what what how do you prepare? Ooh. Or has it changed? And is it, you know, how different is it between theater and film and television? Oh. So can you help us understand, you know, get a little deeper uh, into, you know, technique? And, okay. Uh, yeah. um, that's a great question. Uh, technique is essential. I don't care who you are. Technique is essential. Um, it, yes, it changes all the time. Uh, it, it does depend on what the character requires, what the, what the play, even the time period that the play takes place in. Um, for me, I would say that I am definitely Stanislavski method, but I also have some training in um, Michael Chekhov's work. I do a little bit of Meisner. Meisner kind of gets on my nerves. So... But then I really like what? But then, but then you know David Mamet and William H Macy, they they wrote this book, uh, essential book for the actor, um, where Practical it's aesthetics. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What'd you say? Practical aesthetics. Practical aesthetics, and I discovered that after I had graduated from Minnesota. I think I was in New York when I discovered it, and I was like, oh, this is wonderful. So um, basically. Um, getting to understand uh, the character's 
needs, what they want, what they're working towards, what their emotional state is, the relationships that they're in. That's at least the basis of it. And then, you know, if I'm doing a play if, uh, where my character is from another country, then there's diving into the history of uh, that, that country, uh, what's going on politically, where my character feels, what, what their relationships are. Um, and then, well, for film and TV, it is different because theater, you know, you, you have 300 people, sometimes maybe 12 or 1800 people that you are basically trying to reach. And so your voice has to be of a certain quality. You have to be not necessarily louder, but you have to enunciate so you are understood. And then emotionally, you also have to be very present and in touch with your emotions so that can, so they can feel what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, now for film and TV, it's just this. I call the camera the most demanding mistress in the world. <laughs> because she is, she is, she's like, I don't believe you. And then we're like, oh no, you know, you have to do it differently. And then she's like, I'm out, <laughs> I'm, I'm out of film. And then everything stops because she's out of film and I don't like that light. The lighting, the lighting, <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, it's been a, it's, it's, it's been a crazy transition from theater to film and TV. You just have to kind of, you have to make things smaller. Instead of talking to three, 300 people, you actually have to talk to one or the group of people that you're in and uh not make it more realistic but you just have to make it it's it's a bit more it's intimacy in a different way and i i personally find that you could always tell the theater actor who comes to film and tv uh versus the film and tv actor who goes to theater because that is a harder jump they don't know how to expand themselves. They're used to having a microphone here and here. They're used to having people sit in front of them or maybe six feet away. They don't know how to disperse their energy. It's just more challenging. That's why I'm like, oh, it's always better to start in theater. And also theater is just, it's wonderful. It's, it's you can, you can feel people's energies in the room. You're, you're more present. There's, there's an immediacy about it. Like, you know, if you, especially if you like make a mistake, you have this sometimes, you know, if your, your, your uh, acting partner, their eyes go like this, you're like, okay, what's happening? Now I'm gonna say the other line and okay, you're gonna come back, you're gonna come back and here we go. And usually the only people who know that are you and the <laughs> actor you're with, you know, you don't get to stop and start in, in theater. And I feel like if you have to learn how to think on the fly by the seat of your pants and think on your feet, do theater. So I wanna dig into two aspects of this for a second because okay. I'm, I'm taking advantage of this. Okay. Um, talk to everybody about the difference between a three camera shoot, a television three camera shoot and a film shoot which you know might have is either one camera it might have it might have multiple cameras going simultaneously but it's talk to us about the difference between being in a film and and being on television and being mindful of you know multiple mistresses multiple mistresses okay i have to i have to switch this up a little bit because actually there's really not much of a difference okay now there's not much um, there's multi-cam. Multi-cams are usually sitcoms. Um, they usually have an audience there. They are the most theater-like for me. I love multi-cams because I'm like, great, I got it. It's theater. I know how to do this. Uh, single cam is actually no, no longer just single camera. It's actually probably more cameras, but they don't have an audience. And so you get multiple shots. You, you do... For both film and TV, you the I find the most important thing is you know know who you're talking to, mm. um, really pay attention to rehe in rehearsal and contribute in rehearsal because you got to know where what shot they're doing because you're going to be doing the same shot over and over and over again. Usually they start with the wide shot, which is the establishing shot, and then they move closer. But you can't count on that with everybody. 
uh, some diff di different directors work differently. They might go in out. So you have to be accessible. You have to figure it out. Um, and also if you have to figure out your sight lines. You got to know where you're standing. You got to hit your marks. And, and so you, you have to really work that in rehearsal because sometimes when they put that tape down, that's your marker, that's it. <laughs> you, know? you don't want to be like this in the camera shoot. Right? You don't want to be like that. You, you have to really like, <laughs> find, yeah, you want to be right, right there. Unless he's doing something cool where you're like, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes they might tell you or not. You know, I, was, I had to shoot, um, I shot a, a couple of scenes in uh, Shameless. Now that said, it's fabulous because it's, my scene was uh, handheld. And then they also had another guy for Steadicam and they moved quickly. And William H. Macy said, watch out, they move quickly. I was like, great. But so it wasn't your standard shot. They're going all like this yeah. and everything. And you just have to stand there and let this guy do all of that. And you have to get used to that. And by the way, my partner is here and they're going all over, but I can't look, I can't catch the camera. I got to keep looking at her. So you really have to pay attention. And also, um, sometimes if the director isn't really clear, um, the camera operators, oh, listen, let me tell you something. This is the biggest secret that nobody told me. If the crew comes up and compliments your performance, you've done a good job. Because they don't have to say anything. No, right, right, right. They've been here. They've been like, yeah, yeah, I'm here every day. I'm here every day. Sometimes they'll even want to help you. Because if the director says, oh, if I just want you to stand here and look this direction, the camera operator says, Saida, if you go like this, that light will hit you better here and here and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay, without the director even knowing. And they're like, that's genius. And you're like, yes, to the camera director. So it's just really, it's far more of a collaborative sport <laughs> in a way. I mean, theater is too, but this is even more specific because you don't know what it looks like because yeah. you're in the scene, you know? Now for film, um, to answer that, film, so the TV is kind of getting a lot of cameras as well. And when we were shooting um, the Taking a Pelham 1, 2, 3, bless you, Tony Scott, but he, um, that's the first time I started on the very first day on a film and he had two cameras. I came the next day, there were four. Mm. I was like, wow, that's money. But then there were times when my desk was here and they had these tracks so two cameras could go around at the same time. And it was like, what do you do? And it's like, you focus on who you're talking to. And if there's a problem, they will let you know. Did that answer the question? Absolutely did. Oh, it, cool. It absolutely did because it's, and, and my, the context for the question, which is why I asked this one first. Now we're getting very, very sort of acty technical here, folks. But yeah. this is what this is about. The, you know, this is Saida. So this is why we're doing this. <laughs> so um, I, I'm in, you know, I'm in the midst of, of, of preparing the, the acting class for the, for the fall. And, and I too, very, very similarly having, you know, I've, I've tried them all, um, but, I, but I always gravitate toward Chekhov and uh, Michael Chekhov and, and Stanislavski. Um, but the technical, so the sort of practical aesthetic side of, of Stanislavski, the sort of like given circumstances, what is going on? Why do you want this? What are the stakes if you don't get it? Who's in your way? Who's, you, who's for you? All those practical things, right? Mm -hmm. And even though it's, it's kind of like eat your vegetables. If you don't know these things, you know, you can't think about them during the moment. They're, yeah. they're just given, that's why they're given circumstances, right? right? So, but when we move in the, in the, in the acting class, the, the uh, acting 150 class, when, we, when I transition sort of away from that, that the task-based stuff and into Michael Chekhov, that opens the door, which is what I want to talk to you about, about an inside out or an outside in actor, right? Those actors who are, whose imaginations are turned on by the environment around them. And you know expansion and contraction, and you know and um, sister the three sisters of sensations, and all those things. Like, how much do you allow the environment around you on the outside to affect the psychology on the inside? Versus, if I think the thought, you know, feel the feeling, oh, it will express itself outward. Do you 
where where do you fit on that spectrum? And because uh, I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't think it's part of necessarily. I can imagine how that plays into a film and television shoot, being an outside in or an inside out. Am I making any sense at all? Yeah, you're making a lot of sense. And you know, I don't limit myself. Okay. Again, is it by by role? It's 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 by role, and sometimes it can be the costume. Right. So does that make sense to everybody who's listening? That you know, you can sort of put on a costume, and it suddenly makes you feel differently. It's it's an external. Literally, it's like the way I talk to the students about it is that yes, there's environment. Yes, there's a there's a there's an energy in the room. There's a temperature in the room. There's dynamics of the furniture and all that kind of stuff. But then there's the costume that thing that's literally between you and the world. And as soon as you put that on, you can so feel like somebody else. Talk to us about that. Well, because, it, you know, actually, I think it also comes from the backstory that you've created for the character, frankly. Okay. Because, um, you know, I have the given circumstances, but how am I going to interpret it? How am I going to connect with where the character is emotionally? Right? right. So. And the costume, the role, right? It's still you. You were still, the role of this character. Right? Yes, and so I have to find a way to feel it as fully as possible, so that I can express that. Right now, with the costume specifically, yes, there's a costume designer who picked it out for you, and blah blah blah. But it's coming on my body, and if it does not feel right, then there's a way of what I can communicate with the costume designer, not necessarily what I want, but just, oh, well, this feels, and tell them how it feels, and then maybe come up with an, uh, uh, an idea of what needs to be added or taken away. Also, the set. Right. If this is supposed to be my house, oh, okay. Well, you know, everybody's setting up, and you know, it's not my house, and you know, there are like 50 people in my house, <laughs> and they're setting up lights, and they're moving this, and there's, a and so it's kind of like, oh, okay. And I always, even in, on stage, I always love like, oh, what's the set gonna be like? Because it's like, oh, what it, these are the pieces that I've chosen. My character has chosen. Maybe there's one piece that I can identify with and say, oh, she loves that gold frame. Even if I don't refer to it, that makes me feel closer to the character and actually make this my house. Um, I think, so if you do that in theater, you can do that in film as well. And sometimes where you're like, oh, wow, we're running out of time and we don't have a lot of time. I don't care, I don't care. Even if you're, even during rehearsal, um, I'm connecting and if the director's talking to the lighting person and everything, I'm still looking around and touching things. And I might actually, I'm like, oh, I love this. And you know, little things for myself where I'm like, okay, it grounds me to where I am because you know, like for ruined exactly, it, ruined. Uh, I had props galore. I actually before every show, I would take. It took me ten minutes, and I would do the. I would physically go through the blocking of the, the, throughout that entire show. It always took me ten minutes, but like you know, they had the napkin over here, and I was like, can we actually put it over there because that's it's more functional for me over there. But then when they put the trees in, cause you know, I'm not living in the Congo, but they had these trees and that made me feel closer to it, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the dialect and my wardrobe, you know, and actually during the production or during shooting, you can actually, I'm actually, I've actually felt more connected as we continue going on. Yeah, there's, there's got to, you know, I, I don't know an actor that's, that's somehow the first day of dress rehearsal you know what i mean when you're in the costume and the lights are on and you're and the set's finished and you know whatever and the lights are down in the theater there's just this this energy that comes mm -hmm. over you mm -hmm. it's different you know what i mean that's just that so yeah i i wonder i i wonder at times about actors who spend so much time doing green screening or, or even doing avatar like characters like they've got nothing real around them nothing they have to imagine it all yeah you know do can they afford to be outside in actors or must they be inside out actors you know well you know that's a very good question the first time i saw smallville years ago i was like oh my gosh this 20 year old guy knows something that i don't know 
I don't know how to connect to other people on a green screen, but I'm going to fight for those people in terms of them not having as much technique because they actually do. They have to use their imagination just as much as we do when we're doing a regular play or film or TV. They actually probably have to use it even more. And that's what they have. And so if they are inside out or outside in, I don't care. They're using their imagination and they're conveying what they need to convey. And that's the most important part to me. Because here's the thing, if I get stuck, that's why I'm saying I don't limit myself. If I get stuck using one method and because it changes, you get older, you learn more about life, what's going on with your body. You might not be able to connect the way that you used to. And we all face this. And if we get locked into, this is what it was. This is the way I've been, I've been getting hired and I've been connecting in this way. And if we don't allow ourselves to grow, then you're going to hurt yourself as an artist. You're going to act, you're actually block. you're actually preventing yourself from doing digging deeper and doing even better work and then you and then that's like a residue you take with you you know to every other every other role even though every role is different even though every process is different and you know it's all new every time you start something new you don't really you know you don't i don't know if i can do this i'm, I'm gonna try right right you have to at least try absolutely what so so um was there a particular experience in a particular play or movie or television show that for you is sort of the center of the maze. The sort of, you know, it's like we're out, we're all everything aligned and it all just felt like, my goodness, this is, if only they all could feel like this. There's more than one and for different reasons. I will tell you this, the one play that I saw where I felt like everyone was on the same level was the production of Frost Nixon on Broadway. I, I just, I was like, oh my gosh. And, and it's not a criticism of everything else I've seen, but I felt it. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of things I've been in, I would say a streetcar named Desire that Evo Van Hove did. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, it was so different. It was your non-traditional streetcar and people either loved it or they hated it. I mean, with such a passion and- That bathtub. That bathtub. And I loved what we were doing and it almost didn't even matter what the audience thought. I, I knew the world that we were in. I would say that's the first one where it was like, oh, wow. Especially because it was so different. Um, I would right. also- I would also say... So for those who don't know, Ivo Van Hove, he just did the, the West Side Story that was that was on Broadway for like six nights. I, I, I saw it. Oh. Uh, I was one of those people that, you know, I was, yeah, I was in New York the weekend of March 6th and 7th. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Oh. stupid. Um, but, I, you know, I mean, so um, an incredible, an incredible visionary director. But yes, you either love his stuff or love this stuff or you I don't get it hate it and and I, you know that's unfortunate and but you know what guess what that's theater okay <laughs> but, but the thing is you know west side story is one thing but streetcar mm -hmm. people have very specific opinions about how streetcar should be done and the history of it with brando and blah 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 and the guy poor son of a bitch poor guy excuse me but he's he's just stuck because everybody's going to compare him to brando no matter what he does but the second one I would say was doing Othello with Peter Sellers and Philip Seymour Hoffman and John Ortiz because we were in Vienna, then we were in Germany, and it felt like it was a very large stage and we didn't use a lot of it. There was a lot of empty space. So it, it, it felt we were all on our separate journeys, but like together. Mm. Mm. It was really, really, really unique. What was, what's something about the profession that you could not have anticipated? Oh. When you were like, you're back at Albright and thinking, I'm going to be a professional actress, right? And I'm going to, you know, what, what, what didn't you, what didn't you plan on? I didn't plan on uh, the changes mm. in technology, specifically. I didn't, I didn't plan on 
Well, if you're saying, what did I plan on at Albright? I didn't know anything, so I didn't plan on anything. I just was like, okay, I'm going to go to school, yeah. and so then I'm going to go to graduate school. Yeah, I didn't know it was going to be like this. Or I, didn't, I, I didn't, well, work, working at the Guthrie, I didn't, oh, it was actually after working at the Guthrie, because when I worked at the Guthrie, that was the last, that was the last year or so when they started, they would give you three months of rehearsal. You know, that's when the grants started going away and the money started dwindling and people were not doing very large cast shows. Right. And I didn't expect our rehearsal times to be cut short like they were after after that and pretty much since. That was a very luxurious time that I did not, I didn't realize at the time. Yeah. That was, that was, that was certainly true in in a lot of my experiences. I had one one or two experiences in Europe, in, in England, and in Europe, where it was, we have met how many weeks of rehearsal? Yeah, seven, seven weeks of rehearsal. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And they're paying me. Oh, okay. I'm there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and now it's three three weeks of rehearsal. And you're expected, it's just like a kind of a rush. And it's been a, you have to work even harder, I find. Yeah, I, I, I wonder how things are gonna change post, post COVID and... Um, I don't know. Well, and you know, and also with the social unrest right now how mm -hmm. which, you know we we can't we we can't help but be changed by it um but i need to see action jeffrey i'll be very frank with you talk about I that need, i need to see action i it's not going to be good enough for you to do one more black play outside of february i need to see more multicultural boards for theaters i need to see more multicultural representation in terms of the writers directors, even producers. Yeah. Even yeah. in the Theater Hall of Fame, I need to see more people of color. And I, I need action. Everybody's got a lot of lip service right now, but all right. Well, we all the way up the food chain, right? All the to producers and, you know, the people that are choosing what gets done, you know, what gets to be produced. Yeah, there's, I, I was I was attending a an, an anti-racist uh, webinar the other night uh, about theater and dance programs in America, and there was um, there was comment about how so many theaters in America make the mistake of thinking that community outreach is audience development, and they're not. They're not. You can't you you can't do you know the the black play in February to hope that you're going to attract a different audience and that they might come and you know and see you know, come right. you know, black little Sheba you know, or whatever, I you know, um, you know, in, um, in, in April, it's, if you're going to do community work, you're going to get out there and you're going to have the arts help make significant change. It has to be not because you think of what you're going to get for it. It has to be yes. that, you know what I mean? Yes. And also, it also needs to be in the casting. I don't, I don't believe in colorblind casting. Cause I don't, I don't think that's actually true. Because if you're saying, oh, I don't see your color, then you're erasing me and I am not one to be erased. So therefore, um, instead of having it written as a white male character, how about having people of color audition for it as well? It doesn't, and I, I don't need to see just a string of black plays. I need to see more multicultural representation on the stage, no matter what play you do, frankly. And I don't, and I don't, and, I, and it doesn't mean like substituting a black person and just dropping them in there. I'm talking about writing with people of color in mind. Right. right. Well, sure. and <laughs> and more black writers and more black directors and more yes. producers and you yes. know, designers and you know, um, yeah. It's it. You're right. It's it's time for. It's yeah, time for a lot of a lot of writers of color. They know how to write white people because you have to yeah you know what i'm saying Dude. not a lot of white writers know how to write people of color because they don't they don't know that their history and 
and the world that they live in. No. But you know, we're talking about assimilation. Right. Right? I Yes. So um, the people that are watching don't know, but a couple of weeks ago, you and I had another meeting like this, a magnificent evening with some of our graduating students from the program. And it was such a special event. And I actually, I think I, I, when we were first on, I, I, I think Eric was, was here and maybe even Autumn who didn't get a chance to, to come the last time. So I'm, oh. I'm, they're still, if they're still here, I'm, I'm happy that, that they're here. But can you, because this is an alumni event and because you have a lot of people that are really you know, excited about, about Albright and seeing you and we're all so proud of you. And Thank you. It's, it's just amazing. What, what makes you come back to Albright? It's always good, good to give back. Um, and I want all actors, but especially Albright actors, to know as much as they possibly can because it's a very, it's a challenging industry. It's a very challenging industry filled with people who have their own experiences and then create a lot of stories that can um, prevent a lot of young actors from exploring their own journeys. I've heard some of the most ridiculous ideas, rumors, lies, and I, I, I just think it's really dangerous. A lot of people are very frustrated that they don't have much of a career, and so they make stuff up. There are people who have been background for decades and that if you know if they thought that they were going to be a star you know if there's a young actor who's just starting out and wants to become do a little background so they can understand how a set is and if they meet this very crass frustrated background actor you know like that kid's gone. That kid's going to run screaming for the hills or believe that, oh, okay, if I do this, then I'll, then this equates to that. Like, oh, all I have to do is just constantly bombard the casting directors with my headshot and resume and they'll pay attention to me. And it's like, actually, no, they won't. <laughs> you have to give it some time. You have to find a way to step back and really like take a look at the industry. Um, so I want to I want to help these young actors learn a little bit more about the business, especially now that we have the time because we're all shut down. Um, and also, the, when I'm when I've taught the acting workshops at Albright, it's important to me that not only are you going out um, of graduating from Albright as an actor, but one that knows what they're doing, yeah. one that actually understands talent and understand is on their way of learning a technique that they find is really, really great for them and that they, that excites them, you know, because a lot of people want to be an actor, but they don't know what they're doing. Well, it's really about empowerment, isn't it? It's about, oh, absolutely. I think that goes all the way back to the way that, that Lynn spoke with us, worked with us about, I can, I can tell you things, I can give you tools, I can, you know, it can go this way but you've got to put it to work and you've got to you've got to be empowered enough to say what is working for you and what is not and recognizing where where the gaps in the technique are so that you can you know that you can work on it because you don't want to be disempowered there's enough there's a there's enough of a power that in the role of actor professional actor anyway well, I also just want to add to that because back then there was no, there were no Facebook likes, you see. And yeah. so, uh, so empowerment, meaning not judging how many Facebook likes or how many people are following me on Instagram and blah, 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 but actual empowerment in terms of your development as an artist. Okay. Yeah. They, I, I'm very concerned about the younger generation getting distracted by saying, oh, I have to build my brand before they even know what their technique is, before they even know what they're doing. Oh, I have to have 500,000 people following me in order for me to get something. No. Or maybe I have to get on a reality show in order to start my acting career. Do not do that. They are not actors. They're placeholders. They're personalities. And you can really lock yourself 
in to some unfortunate positions if you follow that path. Like, it's really about what do I want to do as an artist? An artist, not even just an actor, an artist. And it's the thing is, it's all, it's there forever. Once you put things out, they're there, they're there for, but this is why it is so essential that we have people like you coming back and working with our students. And, and particularly because you are an alum, right? And that they, you were literally, literally in the building. I mean, you're literally in the same spot, maybe not the same seats anymore, um, but you know, in some, in some classrooms it is, um, you know, right where they were sitting, right where they were working. Right, and they see what you've accomplished. So I have one last question. We have a couple, a couple of minutes left. Oh so my goodness, talk, it's I, so fast. It, I know, it's, it always goes so fast. Oh, okay. One last question, and which is, which is sort of go, going off this way. So you've done all of these things. Yes. Professionally and personally in your life. Yes. If mm -hmm. you weren't an actress, <sighs> what do you think you would have done with your life? Well, of course, I don't just have one answer. Um, <laughs> and I hope not. No. no. Uh, I'd be a chef. Oh, really? Or an interior designer. I'm also thinking a well, singer, but really uh, a drummer in a rock band. I've always wanted to be a drummer in a rock <laughs> band. <laughs> you can blame the bangles. Haze the Shade of Winter, it just got me. And I was like, I want to do that is bang on some drums. But, you know, the thing is, I can do all of that now. Right, yeah. right, especially now, right? Yeah, especially now. But yeah, it was gonna, it was always gonna be something creative. I don't really have a scientific brain. So it was always going to be something creative where I can um, make something and do something and be like, oh, okay, there. And, and, and share it with people, that's, that's the thing. That's the thing I love about acting is because, you know, I'm an interpreter and I can help people. My, the, the way I interpret a role can help people discover something about themselves or something about other people that they never really knew. And there's always a connected point. And making worlds, whether it's a, whether it's a food world or a, you know, yes. a design world. And yes. Because that's the, that's the thing what Lynn did. That's the thing about Albright, you know? I mean, there are people who are from my class who basically grew up in college watching me on stage. Yeah. And I, um, I love that. And so when I put something on social media, they're the first ones being like, yep, I saw you in that because they're trained to like see me on stuff in, in things. And I, I love that. And you know, there's some scientists from our school who are like, oh yes, you know, I watched you on ha Haunting a Hell House. And I'm like, okay, that's great. But it was, it was a wonderful community at Albright. It was a wonderful small world that, especially in my time of being there, you know, we had, <laughs> so much going on, you know, and um, people who didn't agree with you that you were able to find a way to actually agree without anybody disrespecting each other. We had the African American society. And so people were like, what is that? And we were just engaging with each other that, and it just made it a very, very special place. And then, you know, working with Lynn and working with you. And I, I just, I mean, my timing is, Perfect, man. It's always been perfect. 